Among the deities worshipped by the Romans, few were more beloved than the patron goddess of the city of Athens, Athena, whom they called Minerva, deity of wisdom, virtue, victory, proper ladylike behavior, and female virgins. She was called the perpetual virgin, the Parthenos. And her great temple was called the Parthenon, in all of her extant illustrations or statues, she is portrayed not as a young girl, but as a tall and sturdy woman. Not to beat a dead horse, but this further refutes the claim that the chief definition of Parthenos is young girl and not virgin. Nothing was said to infuriate her more than young maidens having illicit sex. In fact, she was said to have turned a beautiful virgin into the hideous monster Medusa for having had the misfortune of being raped by Poseidon in the goddess temple. Without sacrificing her virginity, the eternal virgin goddess bore a son, Erichthonius, who became the king of Athens. It did not involve a natural conception or a natural birth, though. Far from it. Rather, another god attempted to rape Athena, and upon her thigh fell some of his substance. She flicked it off in disgust to the earth, and from the ground the ancient king of Athens sprung. Beautiful, wise, virginal, and mighty, she was cherished, truly loved, and adored in the hearts and minds of many Romans, and especially the Athenians, when the gospel first began to spread there. Her temple, the Parthenon, of course now lies in ruins, but those who would like to visit a full-scale reproduction of it, uh, not including its subterranean sections, need only go to Nashville, Tennessee, in the USA. There lies the new Parthenon, I still remember the visceral awe I felt after entering once during a college excursion. I had not expected to encounter a 42-foot-tall idol garbed in gold plates and holding the goddess Nike, the visual archetype for classical and mistaken illustrations of angels. One wonders what the experience of visiting the real Parthenon must have been like, situated as it was at the Acropolis. It certainly would not have been as lightly populated as its Nashvillian reproduction. As mentioned, her divine jurisdiction was wisdom, proper ladylike behavior in girls, and young female virgins. Now, every period in a woman's life, just as well as every man's life, was celebrated in cultic rituals dedicated to the deities under whose jurisdictions they fell. Being the goddess of virginity, Parthenoi and their celebrations were under her domain. Older girls would ceremonially pivot toward the jurisdictions of Venus and Juno, that is, Aphrodite and Hera. One such ritual involved two young girls called the Athenian Arephoroi, they were appointed from high-profile families to serve Athena in the Parthenon at the Acropolis for one year. For our purposes, I would like to pin for later reference two duties of their worship. One is that they were charged with beginning to weave the peplos for the goddess's giant statue, a peplos being a full-length, dress-like garment worn by ancient Greek women. Second, the pair would undergo a stylized impregnation and delivery ritual involving the transportation and delivery of wrapped or encased objects through a dark underground passage, objects whose identity neither they nor we would ever learn. This was to allow them to experience womanhood conceptually. Pausanias described it like this. I was much amazed at something which is not generally known, and so I will describe the circumstances. Two maidens dwell not far from the temple of Athena Polias, 
called by the Athenians bearers of the sacred offerings. For a time, they live with the goddess, but when the festival comes round, they perform at night the following rites. Having placed on their heads what the priestess of Athena gives them to carry, neither she who gives nor they who carry have any knowledge what it is. The maidens descend by the natural underground passage that goes across the adjacent precincts within the city of Aphrodite and the gardens. They leave down below what they carry and receive something else which they bring back covered up. These maidens they henceforth let go free and take up to the Acropolis others in their place. Recent scholarship has come to view this rite as an effort to enable young girls to experience the fullness of womanhood. Although the text of Pausanias considers this performance utterly obscure, modern commentators have found the main contours of the rite relatively transparent, writes Barbara Goff of the University of Reading. The Arephoroi enact the process of human reproduction, the timing of their ritual at night and the descent from the Acropolis by a narrow passage would ensure that the actions were accomplished in an atmosphere of dread, and the secrecy surrounding the whole event would dramatize for the Arafroi the necessity of restraining their curiosity, as the Kekropides had failed to do. Now, you might recall the city of Athens as the location for Paul's address to the Roman philosophers at the Areopagus. The Areopagus was located just a few minutes' walk from the Parthenon, in the shadow of the universally adored perpetual virgin goddess of wisdom and young girls. Now, let's switch gears just a bit. Excuse me while I jump ahead a few decades to the year 66. Riots broke out in Jerusalem, led by zealots who believed that God was calling them to retake the Holy Land from the Gentiles through violent bloodshed. They organized the people together and led a violent surprise campaign against the occupying Roman soldiers. Though initially successful, they eventually lost, and much of Jerusalem was destroyed, including the temple. Decades later, the Jewish diaspora, the Jews living abroad, suddenly revolted wherever they were living, from Egypt to Cyprus to elsewhere. The empire was once more surprised, but responded this time by crushing them. Then, roughly 15 years later, in the 130s, the surviving zealots launched one final attack. This time, they were led by one Simon ben Kokhba, whom many believed to be the long-awaited Zionist Messiah. This one is the Messiah, declared one of the most authoritative rabbis of the day, Rabbi Akiva. This time, the Zionist zealots persecuted their Christian brethren. Writing about 20 years later, Justin Martyr records, for in the Jewish war which lately raged, Bar Kokhbas, the leader of the revolt of the Jews, gave orders that Christians alone should be led to cruel punishments unless they would deny Jesus Christ and utter blasphemy. Justin Martyr, First Apology, 31. You see, the surviving Christian Jews had been doctrinally inclined to promote the brotherhood of all men under and through Jesus Christ, whom they proclaimed as the only true Messiah and recognized as the only true temple. The kingdom their souls swore allegiance to was the kingdom of God. This was offensive enough to the Zionists, but to make matters worse, they were also disinclined towards violence even against the powers and authorities who persecuted them. They were thus utterly at odds with the ambitions of the Zionist zealots who consequently saw them as enemies, traitors to Israel. Well, sure enough, this final effort by the zealots, born as it was of pure Zionism and delusions about Simon ben Kokhba, was also crushed. In the aftermath of the Bar Kokhba revolt, the world changed for any surviving Jews in Judea. Jerusalem had been annihilated. It was just gone. And by royal proclamation, 
all practicing Jews were driven out of Judea. The Jews had long enjoyed the unique privilege of being able to freely worship only God so long as they paid taxes. They had been allowed to have their own king, a puppet king, but a king no less. They had been allowed to preach against the Greco-Roman pantheon, but after decades of dealing with the Zionist zealots, the Roman Empire had had enough and revoked their special privileges. Their numbers had also taken a huge hit. During the Bar Kokhba revolt alone, almost 600,000 Jews were slaughtered. In the wake of the revolt, Emperor Hadrian also decided to go ahead and make a proper Roman city out of Jerusalem. A temple to Jupiter, that is, Zeus, complete with a statue inside for worship, was built on the Temple Mount. The city was renamed Aelia Capitolina and was scrubbed clean of Jews and Judaism alike. Now, why did I mention all of that? Because it's important that you realize just how difficult it was in the mid-2nd century to find any Jew for reference who knew firsthand what life in Judea, and specifically temple life in Judea, used to be like. Round about this time, someone we don't know who, wrote what would today be called a fan fiction, starring Mary, the mother of Jesus. Now before we get to it, and boy howdy will we, it needs to be said that the Gentile Christians of the mid-second century seemed to enjoy writing fictive accounts of Jesus and the other men and women mentioned in the Bible. Sometimes these fan fictions seem to come from desires to better explain the faith. At other times, they apparently stemmed from desires to defame the gospel. Just a handful of them include the Gospel of Thomas, the Apocalypse of Adam, the Gospel of Eve, the Acts of Pilate, the Second Apocalypse of James, the Traditions of Matthias, and the Coptic Apocalypse of Paul. So, someone writing a fan fiction about Mary was not at all odd for the time. But what made this fanfic exceptional was that it would prove almost as influential as what we would call the Bible. Given its contents, apparent motivations, and demonstrable ignorance of Jewish life in first century Judea, we can, with some measure of confidence, deduce that the text that we are going to look at in this video, this text which has, for nearly 2,000 years, heavily influenced the evolution of what has become Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox doctrine, was likely written in the mid-2nd century by an Athenian convert to Christianity who wanted to make the faith more appealing to his fellow Athenians. Only someone to whom Minerva, or Athena, and her rituals had been important, and someone who could not find any Jews who had lived in Judea during the first century to advise him, could have written this thinly veiled effort to reinvent Miriam of Nazareth as a glorified Athenian araphoroi and a Christianized replacement for Minerva. The anonymous author's work proved more successful than he had likely guessed, and within a century the ideas that it injected into the minds of Roman converts to Christianity became, sadly, mainstream. It filled the feminine void left by those turning away from the pagan goddesses. The big three throughout the empire had been the male Jupiter, that is, Zeus, and the two females, Juno, Hera, and Minerva, Athena. Now then, let's go ahead and finally get a look at the content of the Infancy Gospel of James, also called the Proto-Evangelium of James. We are first introduced to Mary's parents, Joachim and Anna, extremely wealthy and devout Jews unable to bear children. After extravagant prayer, angels descend to them individually to tell them that they will conceive after all, and that the whole world will talk about their child. 
Anna then gives birth to Mary, whom she promises to send to serve in the temple in Jerusalem as soon as possible. Huh? Since when was that a thing? Yeah, you'll be saying that a lot. And until the day when she can send her there, she barricades Mary in a special room in their luxurious house, never allowing her feet to so much as set foot on the ground outside and never allowing her to come into contact with anything impure or unclean. Anna would summon the virgins throughout the land to come and play with her daughter. On her first birthday, Joachim used his influence to get all of the chief priests and the Sanhedrin and all of Israel to visit her and bless her with eternal fame and, quote, blessing, which will not be exceeded. Mary, in this story, is a celebrity baby, and the entire nation is united in celebrating her and praying for her. Gone is the lowly and obscure peasant depicted in the biblical gospel accounts. When she is three years old, Joachim and Anna, along with a procession of Jewish virgins with torches, carry Mary to the temple by night, where she would live from then on. A priest is there to welcome her. He proclaims that the Lord will magnify her name for all generations. Then she is laid on the third step of the altar and dedicated to God. She becomes a temple sensation, and is from then on fed her food by the hands of an angel. Later passages in this text will spell out that she actually hangs out in the Holy of Holies. Hopefully, just now you picked up on the oddity of a troop of virgins carrying a package in the dead of night. But honestly, that's nothing in comparison to what's to come. It is immediately clear that the author doesn't know how the long-destroyed temple functioned. He is projecting his own understanding of his own people's temples. And so, we have a young girl running around in the Holy of Holies, a priest glorifying the name of a human being apparently at the altar, processions of virgins carrying toddlers by night to a temple, etc. When she turns 12, some priests start to worry that she will pollute the temple if she stays any longer, presumably due to the inevitable onset of her period and the uncleanness that that would bring. See Leviticus 15. The author definitely has access to scripture. And so something ought to be done about her. An angel appears to the chief priest and orders him to gather together all of the widowers throughout Judea, and to tell them to bring their staffs. The trumpet of the Lord blares, and all of the widowers rush to the temple. And lo, a dove pops out of one of the widowers' staffs, and lands on that man's head. And it's Joseph. I have sons, and am old, he protests. While she is young, I will not be ridiculed among the children of Israel. But fearing God, he consents and tells Mary to wait there until he builds a house for her. I will pause again to bring something into sharper focus. In the Dictionary of Deities and Demons in the Bible, Athena, quote, is more prominent as a divinity presiding over the ritual passage of young girls into society especially but not exclusively in Athens. The Athenian Arafaroi, two girls from noble families, had to serve a year on the Acropolis. Their ritual obligations associated them with female adult life, their main duty being to start weaving the peplos for the goddess. As mentioned earlier, a peplos was a full-length dress-like garment worn by ancient Greek women. It was also what the idol wore. So, we should not be surprised when Mary, daughter of noble birth as she is in this story, is assigned a job by the priests, which incorporates weaving an important religious item. To quote from the infancy gospel of James, And there was a council of the priests, saying, Let us make a veil for the temple of the Lord. And the priest said, 
called to me the undefiled virgins of the family of David. And the officers went away and sought and found seven virgins. And the priest remembered the child, Mary, that she was of the family of David and undefiled before God. And the officers went away and brought her. And they brought them into the temple of the Lord. And the priest said, Choose for me by lot who shall spin the gold and the white and the fine linen and the silk and the blue and the scarlet and the true purple. And the true purple and the scarlet fell to the lot of Mary. And she took them and went away to her house. And at that time Zacharias was dumb and Samuel was in his place until the time that Zacharias spoke. And Mary took the scarlet and span it. Though I mentioned it earlier, I will again write that Athena Parthenos, as she was called, that is, Athena the Virgin, was perpetually virgin. And yet, she mothered a child, a god named Erichthonius, king of Athens. You might recall that another god had tried to rape her. Athena, wanting to guard her virginity, had then rejected him, but not before substance had landed on her thigh. She had then flicked it off onto the ground, and from the ground had sprung Erichthonius, whom Athena then raised in secret as her son. He had grown up to become the king of Athens. In this way she had remained the perpetual virgin, whilst being the mother of the king of her city. We arrive now at the infancy gospel of James's version of the Annunciation, where the angel tells her, and thus us readers, that she will neither conceive nor give birth to the child naturally. That last part will become a plot point later on in this story, believe it or not, and ultimately lead to the doctrine that, like the Virgin Athena, Mary, too, will be a physical virgin forever. The Gospel of James reads, And she, hearing, reasoned with herself, saying, Shall I conceive by the Lord the living God? And shall I bring forth as every woman brings forth? And the angel of the Lord said, Not so, Mary. Mary gives the cloth she'd spun to the priest, who tells her that God has magnified her name and that she would be blessed through all generations. Curiously, she keeps her meeting with the angel a secret from him. Then she goes to meet Elizabeth. Elizabeth greets her the same way she does in Luke, but for reasons known only to the author, he then strikes Mary with amnesia. Quote, but Mary had forgotten the mysteries of which the archangel Gabriel had spoken, and gazed up into heaven and said, Who am I, O Lord, that all generations of the earth should bless me? It is from a subsequent passage that we get the tradition that Mary was sixteen when these events transpired, quote, and she was sixteen years old when these mysteries happened. This instead of twelve, as demonstrated as likely in the previous video on Mary. She returns home and hides herself. She doesn't want anyone to see her pregnant because she is, after all, the celebrity temple virgin. Joseph then comes home and discovers her pregnant. He chides himself for having failed to protect the virginity of the temple virgin and wonders what enemy of his could have done this to him. Then he chides her. O oh, you who has been cared for by God, why have you done this and forgotten the Lord your God? Why have you brought low your soul, you that was brought up in the Holy of Holies and that received food from the hand of an angel? Reflecting the fearful atmosphere of the Athenian Arephoroi during their trek through the tunnel and the ignorance of what it was that they were carrying, Mary responds, saying, as the Lord my God lives, I do not know whence it is to me. That night, an angel explains to him in a dream what has happened, and so he makes up with Mary. But that same morning, a scribe named Annas happens to make a house call to make sure Joseph is protecting the girl's virginity and sees with horror that the celebrity temple virgin is pregnant. 
Annas then runs to a priest and says that Joseph has committed a crime by marrying the temple virgin. This is, of course, completely at odds with the biblical narrative. He has defiled the virgin whom he received out of the temple of the Lord, and has married her by stealth, and has not revealed it to the sons of Israel. What happens next is complicated, but basically, Joseph and Mary are summoned to the temple, where Joseph is ordered to return the virgin he'd been entrusted with. He and Mary insist on their innocence, though, so they are both given the adultery test of Numbers 5, 11 through 31. They both pass, of course, and get to go home because the results indicate neither of them has sinned. That's when the census is announced. You will recall that by the time they set off for Bethlehem, Joseph and Mary are engaged in the biblical narrative. But because the author of the Proto-Evangelium of James wants to present Mary as a replacement for the perpetual virgin Athena, he must explain away their marriage somehow. The census provides the perfect narrative opportunity. Joseph then lays the groundwork for the Roman Catholic teaching that Mary was not his wife. I shall enroll my sons, but what shall I do with this maiden? How shall I enroll her? As my wife? I am ashamed. As my daughter, then? But all the sons of Israel know that she is not my daughter. The day of the Lord shall itself bring it to pass as the Lord will. After some dialogue between the two, Joseph briefly becomes the narrator. Mary, who is thinking wistfully to herself, says that she is going into labor. Considering what's about to happen in this story, that's surprising. Just then, Joseph runs into a Jewess and employs her as a midwife. He again insists Mary is not his wife. A woman betrothed to me, and she said to me, Is she not your wife? And I said to her, It is Mary that was reared in the temple of the Lord, and I obtained her by lot as my wife, and yet she is not my wife but as conceived of the Holy Spirit. Here we approach the pinnacle of the author's attempts to depict Mary as the new perpetual virgin deity, who neither conceived nor bore her son by natural means. Indeed, what we are about to read will influence Roman Christians and ultimately Roman Catholics and Eastern Orthodox for centuries to come, all the way to the present. You see, in this story, Jesus is not exactly born vaginally. He teleports out of Mary in a blinding flash and then crawls up to Mary's breast to begin nursing. As if that's not enough, the author then has a character act out Thomas's encounter with the risen Lord to make clear to readers that it is a dangerous and wicked thing to doubt that Mary also remained a physical virgin throughout Jesus' birth. Here I'll read from the text itself. And the midwife said to him, Is this true? And Joseph said to her, Come and see. And the midwife went away with him. And they stood in the place of the cave, and behold, a luminous cloud overshadowed the cave. And the midwife said, my soul has been magnified this day because my eyes have seen strange things, because salvation has been brought forth to Israel. And immediately the cloud disappeared out of the cave, and a great light shone in the cave, so that the eyes could not bear it. And in a little that light gradually decreased, until the infant appeared, and went and took the breast from his mother Mary. And the midwife cried out and said, this is a great day to me because I have seen this strange sight. And the midwife went forth out of the cave, and Salome met her. And she said to her, Salome, Salome, I have a strange sight to relate to you. A virgin has brought forth a thing which her nature admits not of. Then said Salome, As the Lord my God lives, unless I thrust in my finger and search the parts, I will not believe that a virgin has brought forth. And the midwife went in and said to Mary, Show yourself, for no small controversy has arisen about you. And Salome put in her finger 
and cried out and said, Woe is me for mine iniquity and mine unbelief, because I have tempted the living God. And behold, my hand is dropping off as if burned with fire. And she bent her knees before the Lord, saying, O God of my fathers, remember that I am the seed of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Do not make a show of me to the sons of Israel, but restore me to the poor. For you know, O Lord, that in your name I have performed my services, and that I have received my reward at your hand. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood by her, saying to her, Salom, Salom, the Lord has heard you. Put your hand to the infant and carry it, and you will have safety and joy. And Salom went and carried it, saying, I will worship him, because a great king has been born to Israel. And behold, Salome was immediately cured, and she went forth out of the cave justified. And behold, a voice saying, Salome, Salome, tell not the strange things you have seen until the child has come into Jerusalem. The story proceeds to the arrival of the Magi. Despite clearly using the Gospel of Luke, the author cuts out the arrival of shepherds. You will recall that the author wishes to present Mary as superior to the Athenian temple virgins, which entails being from a noble family and sewing religious cloths. The author does not even allow her feet to touch the earth until she has been entrusted to Joseph, before which she is fed by angels' hands and plays in the Holy of Holies. The baby she gives birth to does not even cry. He teleports out of her in a blinding light and is instantly strong enough to climb up to his mother's breast. Mary, having an entourage of poor, smelly shepherds? Why, that would just make her look bad. So he cuts that part out. But the three wise men loaded with expensive gifts? Well, they replaced the shepherds at the nativity. Quote, and the Magi went out, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them until they came to the cave. And it stood over the top of the cave, and the Magi saw the infant with his mother Mary. And they brought forth from their bag gold and frankincense and myrrh. Again, as covered in the previous video, if Joseph and Mary had been given such riches before they presented Jesus at the temple days later, then they would have been obliged to purchase better sacrifices than the doves the law allowed for the poor alone. After then explaining how John the Baptist survived the massacre of the innocents, the text concludes, And I, James, that wrote this history in Jerusalem, a commotion having arisen when Herod died, withdrew myself to the wilderness until the commotion in Jerusalem ceased, glorifying the Lord God, who had given me the gift and the wisdom to write this history. And grace shall be with them that fear our Lord Jesus Christ, to whom be glory to ages of ages. Amen. And that was the infancy gospel of James. For about two or three hundred years, this text spread like wildfire throughout the Roman Gentile churches and greatly influenced how Christians understood Mary. It wasn't until the early 5th century that a pope, Pope Innocent I, was brave enough to admit that it was fiction. But by then the damage had been done. The church had irrevocably committed itself to the teaching that, if nothing else, its content was legit. The content of the text, that is. And that remains the case to this day in Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox churches. So, in summary, the author, likely an Athenian convert to Christianity, takes the virgin conception of Jesus by Mary and asserts Mary's continued physical virginity after the birth so as to complete the maternal similarities between her and Athena. In order to meet and surpass the Athenian Araphoroi, he depicts her family as wealthy noblemen, just as the Athenian virgins transported their foe children by night, the toddler Mary is depicted as having been transported by night by Jewish virgins to the temple. Whereas those Athenian virgins, the Arophoroi, lived only briefly in the Parthenon, he depicts Mary as having lived for about nine years in the temple. 
Just as the Arafaroi experienced reproduction in a frightening atmosphere of ignorance as to what it was that they were carrying, Mary is depicted as living in a state of fearful ignorance as to what it is she is carrying, which is only accomplished through the author's characterizing of Mary as an amnesiac. When the Roman Empire eventually converted to Christianity, the pagan temples were renovated and became places of Christian worship. Rightly so, perhaps. Athena's Parthenon was turned into Panagia Athenotisa, the temple of the Virgin Mary, the Athenian. The statue of Athena was eventually removed from the Parthenon by Christians, likely in the mid to late 5th century. This roughly coincided with its rededication to the Virgin. The beloved statue left a void in the hearts of its devotees. Marinus of Neapolis, writing some time after the event, records a dream seen by one devotee, the philosopher Proclus Lucius. His choice of the philosophic life amply proves how dear he was to the goddess friendly to wisdom. But the goddess testified to that herself when the statue of the goddess, which had been erected in the Parthenon, had been removed by the people who moved that which should not be moved. In a dream, the philosopher thought he saw coming to him a woman of great beauty, who announced to him that he must as quickly prepare his house, because the Athenian lady wishes to dwell with you. This video has explored the merger in Athens of the lowly historical figure Mary and the universally beloved pagan deity Athena and her Arafaroi. So it's actually been limited in its scope of the differences between the historical Mary and the Mary taught and preached by Roman Catholicism. Beliefs of the Roman Catholic Church pertaining to Mary that we haven't looked at in this video include her immaculate conception, that is, her having supposedly been born without a sinful nature, her eventual bodily rapture into heaven, and her reign in heaven as its crowned queen and its voice of compassion, where she intercedes on our behalf and wields maternal authority over Jesus. Neither have we gone over her alleged visionary appearances across the world, where she instructs people to pray the Roman Catholic Rosary, which involves focusing on all of the extra-biblical ideas covered earlier and the ones I just mentioned. If you were to ask a Roman Catholic priest why the contents of the infancy gospel of James has become such an important part of his faith, you would probably be told that belief in such ideas goes back to the early church fathers who wrote extensively about them. The thing is, all, and I do mean all, all of those writings were written after the infancy gospel of James had gone mainstream. Were you to mention that, you might be told that the gospel of James had only been expressing what had always been unrecorded church teaching. The author of the gospel of James had simply been the first to put it to paper. That particular argument, however, happens to be the very same argument submitted by the Gnostics. That is, Gnosticism has always been, they claim, church teaching. But it was not until the second century that anyone wrote it down. So, at the end of the day, what we find in the Gospel of James, in the infancy Gospel of James, in the Proto-Evangelium of James, is not the belated written affirmation, but the very origin of some of the beliefs that differentiate Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox teachings from what is taught in the Bible.